Today on Our Talk, Players and Their Politics, we're going to talk to Karen Asher, part artist, part teacher, part publicist, and full curator of a very wonderful show, an art show of sculpture, contemporary sculpture called Reflections of the Inner Light. Creating an art show is curator's work. They have to take the personal expressions of artists and make a focus from them and present this to an audience where communication is the primary goal. Karen, thank you for being with us in the studio today. Oh, my pleasure. What do you think about this communication? Do you feel like I do that that is the primary goal of a curator's work? <laughs> well, I think the primary goal is to present an exhibition that people will be interested in coming to the museum and see. It's something that they can learn something from, something that they can appreciate, think about, enjoy. Well, how do you get them to do that? Do you think that what they appreciate and see is totally visual or does it also have to be disclosed and be aesthetic, um, philosophical, mm. uh, contemporary, pol contemporarily political? Mm -hmm. What do they get out of looking at art? Uh, I think that, that to some extent it depends on the piece. Some pieces are very narrative. In other words, they sort of have a story to tell. The more you look at them, the more you learn from them, the more you think about them, and you bring your own experience to looking at the piece. And that, that helps you to understand it. Well, um, when you are going to fill a space with art mm -hmm. and your attitude is primarily for an audience to enjoy the space. Mm -hmm. um, do you use, um, besides the artwork, other things mm -hmm. to get them to understand what the art is about? Well, sometimes curators use labels. In other words, sometimes the artist helps you also by giving the, the piece a title which makes some sense, which provokes thoughts on your part, as opposed to a title like Untitled or Matrix X or something like that, which is really doesn't have any meaning. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, the, the artwork that I enjoy looking at is artwork which does have meaning, which does tell a story, which does provoke an interaction with the viewer. When an artist um, chooses volunteers to put a title on a piece that says Composition mm -hmm. 1 or Matrix X. Mm -hmm. um, is an audience supposed to get an idea from that that the artist doesn't want to give any clues about what the piece <laughs> is about or that the piece is not about anything that you can name? Or mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Well, I think it means that art is open to interpretation. I think the artist may have had one or two or n numerous things in their own mind when they created the piece. And to some extent, they don't want to disclose that if they don't give it a title. And they want the viewer to bring their own experience to it and come up with their own ideas and own interpretations of it. But uh, most of the pieces in the show, Reflections of the Inner Light, do have titles. I think that the artists want to communicate with their viewers, and many of them find that giving a title helps the viewer to understand the piece. Well, let's then talk about specifically the Reflections of the Inner Light and the artists that you chose. How did this get started? Mm. 
Uh, it got started because, frankly, I live in, in Rhode Island, uh, where the Rhode Island School of Design is located. And as a result of that, a lot of people come to Rhode Island to study art, fall in love with the state, and end up staying there. Many uh, people that I know are artists. That's not surprising, considering how much I enjoy art and that I work in an art museum. And in seeing their work, I saw that there was, in my own mind, something which tied some of their pieces together. Uh, a certain spirituality, perhaps, a certain intuition, and I, it, it occurred to me that it ma would make an interesting show and to give people from Connecticut, who may or may not have seen their artwork before, the opportunity to, to meet them and to see artwork created by very talented people who live just over the border. Mm -hmm. So Reflections of the Inner Light was part of your idea um, from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no. Uh, I think that some of the artists in the show uh, took that title in a very literal way. For example, there's one artist who works in asphalt and in, and in copper and brass. And there's the contrast there between the dark, heavy, heavily textured asphalt and the bright, shiny, very reflective surfaces of the brass. So that would be the, the literal interpretation. And then there are other artists who think that the inner light means something else entirely. It's uh, sort of your own intuition to some extent or sort of your relationship with God. So you talk to them, when you talk to them about this show, about the subject, the focus that you had gotten mm -hmm. with the original idea of putting this show together. And, um, and they reacted to this idea, this subject, reflections of the inner light. Mm. Um, and as you say, differently. They re reacted differently. Well, how I chose the artists to some extent was I sent out a letter to a, I got the mailing list of a group called the Sculptors Guild, <coughs> excuse me, which has their offices down in Soho in New York. And I wrote them a letter saying that I was interested in putting together a show of contemporary sculpture. Could they please send me a list of all their members? Uh, it happens that the Guild has members across the country, but the museum, for financial reasons, was not able to. Uh, we could not afford shipping and insurance and things of that nature. Sure. Even so, that is curators, uh, within the curator's um, uh, domain. Mm -hmm. You have a budget yes. to deal with. Oh, absolutely. And so you can't just fill this space that we're talking about mm -hmm. with art objects from anywhere or of any size. No, there's the practical reality that definitely comes into the picture. So there's those practical business of size mm -hmm. and mobility oh, absolutely. and insurance right. and tra the, all that traveling crating up and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I limited the, it therefore for practical reasons. And the museum pays <clears throat> all those kind of uh, charges when an mm -hmm. artist's work is going to be presented in a museum or in a gallery. Mm. Yes, it is the it usual thing that the artist doesn't pay for it, but that the the presenter gets to pay for that. Well, how it worked with this particular exhibition is, most of the artists that I chose were from Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. From that list that you got from Soho. That's correct. And so they basically they delivered their own work. They put it in the back of their truck or their car or whatever the case may be and literally drove it up to the museum. And when they arrived, we helped them unpack it was and move it in. Was this to jury the show or you had oh, already picked no. it from slides? That was at the very end when I had, after I had already picked Chosen. it. Chosen. Yes. So how did you choose? Okay. Well, I sent from this list that I got from the Sculptors Guild, I wrote a letter to all the members who lived in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New York and asked, uh, described briefly the show, giving the title and so on, and inviting them to send slides and a resume and any supportive material they may have had, such as reviews from previous exhibitions, et cetera. And at that time, I had no idea if any of them would respond, and if so, how many. And or with what. Or with what. That's exactly right. Because you didn't know each of the pieces that are in this show. That's correct. You had some in your mind that you... Yes, yeah, some of them I had seen. I had gone around to numerous galleries down in New York, so I had seen their work there. And I had seen it in, in a museum in Rhode Island, et cetera. And so some of them I was acquainted with. I didn't know the entire body of their work. I had seen perhaps two or three pieces of theirs, which gave me some indication. But I wanted to reach out further and give other artists the opportunity to participate as well. I wanted to broaden the spectrum. Right. So when I received the slides, I looked them over. And the slides that I found most appealing and there, that I therefore th thought an audience would find most appealing, I called them up and made appointments to visit them at their studios. 
so that you could see the artwork yeah, firsthand. Absolutely. I thought that was really important. A slide, as you know, is about that big. And uh, from that, it was very difficult to tell the scale of a piece. There were a number of surprises, actually, when I went to the studio. Sometimes a piece that I thought would be about you know, that big and sit on a pedestal ended up being you know, eight feet tall. <laughs> so obviously that, that changes the whole direction. I think we're going to see one of those pieces uh, yeah. <laughs> before this hour is over. That's right. And so also the other uh, good thing about going to the studio was sometimes uh, an, an artist will send you five or six slides. When you go to his or her studio, you'll find that they have hundreds of pieces. And perhaps the ones that you saw in the slides may or may not be the ones you would actually want to include in the show once you had the opportunity to see all of their work. Were you surprised at their reactions to reflections of the inner light? Uh, most of them were very intrigued by the title. They loved the title. Nobody ever said anything to me about, what is that supposed to mean? I mean, they knew right away. They could and yet relate they, to it. they knew, but they differed in what they knew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of them thought it was their inner light mm -hmm. that would be reflected in a form, and others thought actually a light would be reflecting mm -hmm. on a piece. Is that so? Mm, no, not no really. One ever I thought don't think it would no one ever reflection. thought that. No. What did they think? The piece the other, the, the piece itself well, would reflect? Well, I think the inner light to most of them is their own sort of source of their creativity, their own in source of inspiration. And so that's why in almost everyone that I asked actually felt that their work fit under that title. Perhaps I it's, see. it's broad enough to, to hold many different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Well, when we see the show, we're going to see quite how different the pieces are one from the other. Mm -hmm. And there is a quite a variety of um, pieces. Well, How many artists? Actually, there are 18 artists altogether, but that variety was very intentional on my part. Uh, I think that I wanted to have a show of contemporary sculpture, which obviously includes many different media. You know, you could have your more traditional media like brass, bronze, stone, clay, wood, and you can also have many non-traditional media such as wire, rope, things like that, mm -hmm. feathers. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of all of those things, um, yeah. in just a moment, we, we will be able to see. Um, so these, there are 18 artists, and they yeah. come from the tri-state area mm -hmm. of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Mm -hmm. And New York. And New York. Yeah. No road, uh, did we say no, Rhode no, Island? Not, not Massachusetts, Massachusetts. Rhode, Island, Rhode Island, Island, Connecticut, and right. New York. That's right. Uh huh. And they are of various sizes. Uh, they're all contemporary. They're um, uh, all live artists of different ages. Oh, yes. That was very important to me also. I was thinking about a lot of things while I was putting the show together. One of them was gender. I wanted to have a good mixture of male and female. Uh, the other was age. Uh, some of the youngest person uh, in the show is in her 20s, and the oldest person is a gentleman in his 80s. So art can be created by people of all ages. Well, let's take a look now at Reflections of the Inner Light.
Karen, those pieces that we just saw, um, the entire show is done in a mixed media. You can see that right away. There are pieces in, in wire and there are pieces in um, metal. Um, how does the audience really uh, know enough about that work without a big verbal blurb on the wall? <laughs> well, sometimes people can come to the Lyman Allen and actually get a tour of the work. We have a, a docent corps, which are a bunch of trained uh, tour guides. And in fact, I've trained them to, do, to give tours of this particular show. Usually the curator of every exhibition does train the tour guides so that if school groups or uh, elder hostel or any group of people really can call the museum education department, make an appointment, and get a tour. Mm -hmm. And this particular show also um, has a, a whole schedule of artists talking about their own pieces. Yes, that's right. And was there uh, an, an audience would like that because they would like to hear about a piece from uh, an artist? Yes, we have a program called Food for Thought. It's on every Wednesday. It begins at noon. Uh, people are encouraged, in fact, to bring their own bag lunch. The museum provides beverages and dessert. Mm -hmm. uh, they eat the lunch in the Hensel Library and afterwards, usually the curator, in this case myself, uh, introduces various artists. We have a different artist from the exhibition coming every week from the beginning of the exhibition through uh, the beginning of January when mm -hmm. the exhibition closes. Mm -hmm. We also have a uh, Sunday brunch program. I believe that's coming up, as a matter of fact. It's on November the 14th when you can come to the museum and uh, have brunch and again meet the artists. Uh, well, it's interesting to have audiences come and interact with art artists, whether it's for lunches or brunches or Sunday afternoon lectures or even uh, any time they drop in if they can get a dozen to come through. Because I think that the verbal words help a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you must have uh, made a definite f decision not to write a whole lot of stuff on the mm -hmm. wall for each piece. I know that museums tend to ricochet back and forth, should we do it, shouldn't we do it? You're right. There's a bit of controversy about that in the museum world. In some museums, they do have more interpretation. I think um, I'm conflicted about it myself, to tell you the truth. Oftentimes, I go to a, a large museum, for example, the Metropolitan in New York, and find that, much to my chagrin, I often spend more time reading the label than I actually do looking at the piece. <laughs> and somehow that seems wrong to me. I think I'd rather, if I'm going to look at art, I want to look at art and not spend all my time reading a label. I see. Well, I guess there is a controversy <laughs> about that because perhaps if it were written better, you would understand the piece longer. Mm. That is m enough to stay longer with a piece mm. and see it from different dimensions. Whereas if you didn't know about the piece, you might walk by it mm. more quickly. In any case, the best thing is to hear about it from an artist, if especially you're dealing with contemporary art, I should think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have um, some specific pieces. Do we have tape ready now for some specific pieces um, that you talk about? Um, I think now is a good time to see that. 
Uh, this is a particular piece called The Coals. It's by an artist named Robert Taplin. He's from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And I chose this piece to be in the exhibition because of its strong emotional content. I think that when you first look at it, it's uh, obviously two figures, a man and a woman. The woman is squatting on the floor, <coughs> and the man is standing up. And he's holding what appears to be a broom of some kind in his hand. If you look at the expressions on their face, they appear to be in agony. Obviously, they're very troubled. And in speaking to the artist about this piece, I know that he made it during a very emotional time in his life. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind my telling this story. But his wife, unfortunately, had just had a miscarriage. And he was very upset with that. He felt um, that he wanted very much to help his wife. He loved his wife very much. but he. There was really nothing that he could do about it. That's why the agony on his face. Uh, she's holding a bag on the floor, and uh, <laughs> that represents her womb, in essence. Wow. Uh, so this is a very personal story. Yes, and it is. And without you being there, an audience might look at this piece and not catch anything mm -hmm. about that uh, program of mm -hmm. that particular piece, the, mm -hmm. the, the story of the art. Mm -hmm. um, but um, is, isn't there also in that room a table with books about the artists? Yes, that's right. So I put together a, a book about each artist, which has copies of their portfolio in it, uh, their resume, excuse me, uh, various reviews from different shows. And also in the brochure that I put together, I gave each artist an opportunity to speak for themselves. And they disclose a little bit about their philosophy and their yes. in-touchness with the world wh wh at whatever level that is. Mm -hmm. Some are more spiritual than others, some are more political than others, mm -hmm. and they talk about that in the brochure. That's right. So there's a lot, even though there are no verbal descriptions on the wall, there mm -hmm. is a lot of verbal information that one can pick out of this show to help them understand a mm -hmm. piece. Um, there's yet another piece. Um, that we have that you um, showed us particularly? Uh, yes, this is a piece by a ceramic artist named Jim Visconti who lives in Saunderstown, Rhode Island. Uh, his pieces look very archaeological. They look ancient. Uh, they look like something that you might uh, dig up if you went on a dig somewhere in the Middle East, perhaps. But the reality is, of course, that they're not old at all. They're brand new. Uh, they're very beautiful in surface. They're made out of porcelain, which is a really fine white clay. And they're done by the raku process, which is a Japanese firing technique, where you actually remove the piece uh, after it's been in the kiln, and it's red hot. And you place it. Uh, it can be in uh, pine needles or sawdust or some material which will ignite. And that's what creates the cracks and the fissures that you can see on the surface of the piece. Uh, there are also what appear to be letters on the surface of the piece. Uh, some people think that they look like Greek letters, or they look like Egyptian hieroglyphics, or they may look oriental. Actually, they're, in some ways, they're all of the above. They're not any particular letter, but uh, they refer back to different cultures, uh, different times. And I think what the artist is trying to say here is that uh, we're all one culture, one people. Mm -hmm. that we have more in common than we have dividing us. And he's also, um, it seems to me, talking a lot about time, eras, foreverness, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, antiquity being uh, related to the contemporary world mm -hmm. that we live in, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, even his shape, um, his kind of um, uh, religious, kind of shape, maybe there are scrolls inside, or mm -hmm. does it remind us of, of, of tablets, and, mm -hmm. um, and certainly all of the cracking and all of the references to the antiquity mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. um, and yet he's a contemporary artist mm -hmm. um, who will um, absolutely show us that uh, contemporary things don't always have to be so on the cutting edge mm -hmm. where they are not tied to where we've been before. Mm. Well, his personal interpretation comes a lot from his dreams uh, and from his meditations. He calls those pieces objects of power. Oh, so mm -hmm. 
So that is a very spiritual mm. uh, kind of notion, and he gives us that notion in his title. Mm -hmm. He gives the clues right there. Um, there are both men and women, as you say, in this list of artists. Right. Can you always see, f or can, do you think you can tell from looking at the pieces whether or not a man has created it or a woman has created it? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, some, I think the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. There's one piece in particular which is called Open Woman by an artist named Christian Corbett. And that one, I think, is, has a particular female sensibility. Uh, I believe we're going to we're, uh, be we seeing will. more from her later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see that very piece later on. And um, before we do, we're going to stop for a public service announcement where the Griffiths Art Center would like to focus on beautiful public art in the area in Connecticut. <laughs> process that fills our lives. See it. Enjoy it. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Griffiths Art Center, New London, Connecticut. Hello again. I'm Rona Retrick at Arts Talk, and I'm talking with Karen Asher, the curator of Reflections of the Inner Light. We were just talking about the pieces in this sculpture show, um, and um, you were saying that uh, it's hard to detect most of the time whether a piece is done by a man or a woman. And in this show, mm -hmm. there are um, not quite half as many uh, women as there are men, but there is a goodly number of women artists. Mm -hmm. um, and sculpture is sometimes a very heavy, mm -hmm. hard uh, media to be doing art in. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do see a lot of women. I was actually pleased by that. I think a lot of there's this sort of stereotype that women artists, you know, do watercolors and they paint, you know, pretty flowers and things like that. Well, that stereotypes out the window as far as I'm concerned, because, as as you said, women are obviously capable of cutting metal, of welding, of doing all the things that men are capable mm -hmm. of, and they obviously have a great creative spirit. Mm -hmm. And they're not they don't stop at the medium. No, I don't they'll think do they'll overcome medium. Mm -hmm. whatever obstacles are in their path to create the work. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm very happy to see that, and uh, it's interesting to see that you can't quite tell often whether mm -hmm. a piece is done by a man or a woman because we have so many expressions that we share, mm -hmm. and if art is not about expressing personal uh, feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, then we don't know what art is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is the search when we talk mm -hmm. about art and audience. We want, as art directors and it, uh, as art teachers, and we want to help an audience connect mm -hmm. with the art pieces and with uh, art generally. Absolutely. Um, the communication is, right. is back to that really again. <laughs> the same. It's back to that again, and it, mm -hmm. it is 
for me anyway, the goal mm. of people teaching about art. Mm. And I think it's the goal even of artists to disclose something about themselves and the world in which they live in. Oh yes, although artists are very vulnerable once they do that though, because their heart and soul is right out there for everybody to see. Well, maybe that's why they name some of the pieces Composition X. <laughs> Um, but um, tell me now, we, we looked at uh, Visconti's work and we looked um, at the beautiful figurative work. Um, in this show, some of the art is uh, more traditional mm -hmm. than other pieces. Now we're going to um, see a couple of specific artists um, and listen to them talk about their art. And perhaps a little bit of the style question will mm -hmm. come up and we'll talk about it after we see them. Um, but now let's look at the work of um, Mary Bailey. This is uh, the third piece I have in the show, and this is a piece called Cornucopia. I finished this piece in 1992, and it's part of a series of six large floor-standing pieces, which I thought of as, as game pieces. Um, this piece, entitled Cornucopia, is about uh, just the richness of life, um, the sort of overflowing uh, fecundity of uh, the variety of existence in not only in, in flowers but in human personalities. Uh, I was very excited about being asked to partake in this show uh, with the title Reflections of Inner Light. My work is very much about uh, story and content and what it is to be human. Um, when I first started as a sculptor in college in the late 70s, early 80s. A lot of the work that was being done at that time was uh, either very minimalist art, conceptual art, or very minimalist sculpture. Uh, and I immediately felt that my personal goal as an artist was going to be to communicate, to st tell a story, to bring humanity back into work. Um, and have been doing that in one way or another ever since. Uh, and this piece is really the culmination of all of the work that I've done over the last 10 years um, in terms of formal understanding of art and uh, all my pieces that I make are very spontaneous. I don't, uh, I don't make maquettes. I start out with an idea, I do a lot of drawings and then I let the piece develop as I go along. And in this case, I started with the idea of making these uh, very imaginative flowers. And I wanted each piece to have a different personality. Um, for example, this one over here uh, is the dangerous flower, very spiky, uh, something that you wouldn't want to get too close to. Uh, other ones uh, have sort of a retarded quality or a simple, very simple quality. Um, each one has a different formal look to it. Some are very open, some are closed, some are flat. And 
then there was the question of, okay, after I'm done with making these flowers, how am I going to display them? And uh, it might seem obvious, but I thought about a lot of different methods before I came up with the idea of the vase. Um, the other interesting thing was I first conceived of this piece as very colorful, painted, and as soon as I had it built, I realized that these shapes were so strong they didn't need paint. And that's when I started to draw with graphite. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I used the graphite to really bring the surfaces alive. And when I got down to the base of the piece, all of a sudden I had more of a, of like a canvas to paint on than complex three-dimensional shapes. And I just started to draw. And when I, st I started to draw, almost doodle the objects that came to mind. Um, at the time, my grandmother was very ill and dying. Um, as a matter of fact, she died while I was working on this piece, and I went to her funeral um, and came back and finished the drawing. And there ends up being uh, pictures of sort of ancestral photos that I ended up drawing, pictures of my mother when she was you know, six months old, which I've never seen, pictures of my great grandfather. There are pictures of um, my grandmother in, sort of in her deathbed. There are also pictures of joyous things, pictures of uh, food and um, sailing and mountains, just whatever came to my mind at the time. And I also had my studio in downtown Bridgeport, so there are pictures of uh, police cars and guns. Uh, it was not a safe neighborhood that I worked in. Um, let's see, some other things that I could talk about are um, my interest as an artist is as a communicator, as somebody who tells stories, uh, as somebody who sort of creates the myths of our time. Uh, one of my great sources of inspiration has been the art of Africa, the art of um, uh, New Guinea, uh, the Sepik tribe in New Guinea, the art of the um, Pacific Coast Northwest Indians, uh, where art was used and made to be a part of the ritual of everyday life. Um, in today's society, art is relegated to the museum, uh, but at least it is in the museum. Uh, I think that um, one of the big reasons that my work tells a story is because I want people to be able to look at it and to be able to um, see their own life in it and be able to relate to it and understand the story I'm trying to tell. Uh, not that very abstract art doesn't do that in its own way, but I think that people's imaginations need rekindling in uh, this late part of the 20, 20th century. I think that we have been taught to be very goal-oriented and very rational and very um, restrained in, in our emotional expression, and uh, I like to to blow that all apart.
This is the third piece that's in the exhibit. I call her the open woman. I made her in 1987. It's a self-portrait. And at the time, I was doing much more abstract work, like the longboat. Um, I was working with very natural materials, which have always interested me. But at that time in my life, I wanted to, to be much more emotional in my statement. And I knew that the only thing that could do that would be the human body. I started with myself because I was available. And uh, I, my concept was that if I made a portrait of myself realizing some of the things that I wanted in my own life, that that would transform my life. And that actually did happen. I made her, I cast her on my own body, which was rather difficult to do. And then I took those pieces, I made her so that she's open, that she can be passed through. I made her as a passageway, as a conduit. She's open, she's completely free to accept all the, the the beauty and the, the hugeness of the universe. I wanted nothing between myself and the entire universe. And so I created the piece basically to make that happen. Um, I always now use the body because it's a way to express, it's a metaphor for that inner light. And I think that this, this show is very aptly named. The paradox is that, as an artist, you're always using the physical, the physical part of the world to make or to represent the non-physical, and that's very difficult to do. I used the white feathers. Uh, I use that mostly because it captures light, and because feathers have been my friends and something I've been interested in since I was a tiny child. I'd pick up anything that I found in the woods. The feather is a symbol of flight, of not being earthbound. So she's filled with that. That allows everything to come to her, uh, to reflect off of her without harming her. And I also made her in this position which is um, suggestive. She is receptive in a, in a sensual manner. That's to, for me, that was to show that she's She's totally unprotected. She doesn't need any protection. She's open to whatever is in her life. Uh, this portrait was very pivotal for me because it taught me that I could use my art to change my life. And since my, my art is always about my life, it is a way of living my life. The two are not separate. I started talking about this and people came to me and said, would you try this with me? Would you let me be the next model. And uh, I started on a series of what I called the woman warriors. I was working with women because as a woman I had many things to say about uh, the position of women in society and uh, that was very helpful. One thing that happened is a, a friend who'd had a mastectomy came and said, let's do a portrait. And in this portrait I tried to empower her with the situation that had happened to her, with the crisis she'd gone through. I made her as a warrior offering the breast that she had lost. I turned the sutures into a harp that she could pluck because she was a musician. And this led me to the next portrait and the next portrait and eventually to the woman that I did in the box that I call back through the looking glass. There was something unique about her that made me want to express my fear, our fear of death. And since that's a universal concern, I used her particular fear, which was about elevators. And that is not the same, but it's not elevators we fear, it's crashing and dying in the elevator. So I used that and I made the metaphor through her. And when you open the box, you look inside, you see the light. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you see the bones. You have to go to a place where you strip yourself to the bare bones in order to face your fear. And then you come back. You come out of the looking glass and you carry with you all of the knowledge, the wisdom, and the beauty that you found in the other side of it. And that's what that piece is about. I also made it so that when you open the door and you look inside the piece, you see yourself and you know that the only thing to fear is really your own fear, your own misunderstandings or misconceptions. So all of my work has been about 
uh, understanding living my life. My interest came from childhood. I've been studying myths and what, how you can express the, the way life is lived through myth, through art, because all of it is a metaphor for uh, what we do, what we are. And uh, I very often use a mythical theme. There are pieces in my studio that, um, that I've done either with myself or with someone else. I will meet someone and suddenly I see them as the embodiment of a myth, um, either specifically or in a, in a way that, that you can read when you look at the piece, but you don't necessarily, you say, well, I've seen that before. I, that rings a bell, but you don't know what it is. You just know the quality comes through. And um, the piece that I'm working on right now is, is a portrait of a man who's an analyst, a psychiatrist in New York. And again, I used his unique abilities to understand a vast scope of things, to have a magic to help people with. And I created him into what I call the Renaissance man. He's a magician. He's compassionate. He knows a great deal. He doesn't have the answers, but he's willing to take the ride with you um, to, to be part of, of um, your journey. Two wonderful artists, not only to show for themselves and the work that they do that I love, but also very good examples showing how the show that you put together, Karen, mm -hmm. is a great example of both traditional and non-traditional in this contemporary art world. Mm. Um, don't you think? Oh, yes. I think that uh, I love both of those pieces. And uh, it was one of my greatest pleasures, actually, as curator, was to meet all of these people and have the opportunity to get to know them a little bit. I think in Mary Bailey's piece, to go back to what I had said earlier about how women are so often depicted as stereotyped as doing flowers, and Mary Bailey has chosen to do flowers, but in a, a traditional whole, subject. That's right, but reinterpreted in a whole new way. She calls that series Dangerous Flowers. Uh -huh. And those daisies, they're tough. They're yeah. not your, your typical pretty daisy. The they're sizes are not traditional. Absolutely. The shapes of the flowers are no longer traditional. Yeah. But she's taken a traditional subject and she's put it, it very much into our everyday uh, spectrum of wondering about the future and mm -hmm. being unsure about our world. Mm -hmm. What about Christian's piece? Well, I think that Christian's piece is kind of a flip of the coin as well. I think very often uh, art, uh, artists have used nude women as models, as muses, as sources of inspiration. And here she's used her own body and reinterpreted in a whole new way and exposed herself, her soft inner core, kind of turned the thing inside out. Yeah, she's exposing a woman from the inside Side out, out. Yeah. as <laughs> opposed to just as a Barbie symbol and a beautiful mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. um, not that all wonderful uh, women subjects are, are uh, disclosures of, of ineffectual people, but I mm -hmm. think this is a very interesting way of looking at the modern independent mm -hmm. woman. I think you did a wonderful job with this show, <laughs> oh, and you. I think that it's a show um, of optimism and joy mm -hmm. and longevity and imagination, and especially of love, mm -hmm. a wholeness of spirit, I think, I mm -hmm. found, mm -hmm. in these men and women artists. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a joy to see for me, and mm -hmm. I congratulate you on a beautiful curatorial job. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I hope that our audience um, enjoys sculpture and takes the time to walk around the piece, because sculpture is in the round, and look and see every nook and cranny that you can. An artist has purposely put all those parts there, and find out why and what all the shapes refer to, and enjoy sculpture. You will see that you will if you take the time. Thank you for being with us at Art Talk. Tune in again next week. This is Rona Rutchick.